Perhaps um, I, I should also say in that context uh, that um, in recent years I have actually been spending much more time covering Pakistan and Afghanistan. <coughs> in fact, ever since some 9-11, some mixture of that region and looking at uh, American strategy has been my, uh, my principal concern. Uh, in, um, and I just got back from India on, um, on Sunday. Uh, this is the second time that I have found myself covering a, a, a crisis and um, military actions in the former Soviet Union from part of, of South Asia. In August 2008, during the Russian-Georgian War, I was actually based in Peshawar, uh, covering the rise of the Taliban Islamist rebellion in Pakistan, and um, had the, the curious um, experience of watching the crisis on a mixture of the BBC, of course, but also on Russian television uh, in the home of Russian-speaking Afghan refugees in Peshawar, so a little complexity there. Now, I must say that after the events of August 2008, uh, I thought that I could, if you like, safely concentrate on uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, because I felt that Western policy in the former Soviet Union, after that rather bitter lesson of what happened in August 2008, was probably, was in my view, certainly going to become uh, more cautious and wiser. Uh, because, of course, after all the <coughs> rhetorical support for Georgia, uh, after the American and British pressure for Georgia to become a NATO member, which very fortunately France and Germany resisted, in the end, uh, so, and by the way, I mean, all this Western support and US support in particular, uh, was clearly largely responsible for the war. Uh, Saakashvili would not have uh, sent his troops into South Ossetia and attacked the Russian forces there had he not believed, however erroneously, um, that he could count on US help if Russia counterattacked. I mean, if he didn't believe that, then his actions would be simply and, and literally insane. And of course, um, given uh, his repeated vis uh, invitations to Washington, the visit of George Bush uh, to uh, Georgia, and so on, you could say that he had some reason for believing this, um, and some reason, uh, even if he was formally warned that America would not fight for him. After all this rhetoric, after all this emotional support from the US Congress, it was perhaps not surprising that a man as emotional as, and as nationalist as Saakashvili did get carried away and convinced himself that America would fight for him in a crisis. Well, as we all know, America did not fight for him in a crisis, nor, of course, did the Europeans, uh, and Georgia was defeated. Um, not nearly as crushingly defeated as it might have been, remember, it would have been militarily entirely possible for, Mos for Russia to march into Tbilisi um, in columns of four in August 2008 and depose Saakashvili. Um, they didn't because Moscow saw no interest in that. Uh, after uh, taking, uh, driving the Georgians out of South Ossetia um, and uh, declaring the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, Russia had no interest in going further. Now, in August 2008, um, a key role uh, in America's failure to respond uh, was played by the US uniform military. As many of you may know, there was a suggestion from Vice President Dick Cheney actually to send American troops to Georgia, not perhaps into action directly with Russian forces, uh, but to send a very strong message to Georgia. And of course, once you have troops on the ground, well, things can get out of hand. <coughs> that was vetoed flat by the Pentagon. Um, by the then Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense, Gates, but with the full support of Admiral Mullen and the uniform military, uh, who essentially um, have followed two lines. Uh, the, the, the first, um, that uh, a, a war with Russia on the ground is in any case simply inconceivable. But secondly, uh, that uh, it was 
particularly inconceivable then, uh, with America still heavily involved in Iraq and facing a deteriorating situation in Afghanistan. And in the wider scheme of things, um, an armed confrontation with Russia, uh, it, of course, completely confuses and undermines uh, what is the desire of all four American armed services now, which is uh, to try to avoid conflicts and commitments elsewhere or new commitments elsewhere in order to concentrate against China. Um, I'm so sorry, I mean the pivot to Asia. Concentrate against China. Um, and of course, so what you have in, in the United States Armed Forces is a situation where the Army and the Marines don't want more conflicts because they are exhausted by their efforts in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And as Mr. Gates himself said, any US president uh, who advocates a new ground war in Asia should have his head examined. The Navy and the Air Force, all their spending plans, all their configurations for the future are to do with China and, of course, defending uh, the, the Persian Gulf if necessary. But interestingly, the other thing that happened in 2008 uh, was that um, two um, admirals in succession, Admiral Fallon and Admiral Mullen, in effect were instrumental in blocking plans by the US administration, the then Bush administration, uh, for an attack on Iran um, to, to, to disable uh, Iran's nuclear program. <coughs> Once again, because of the firm belief that America simply could not afford more risks and more entanglements of this kind, given its commitments elsewhere. And the, the de facto support of the US military uh, ha has been, I think, very important in allowing Obama to go as far as he has in what at least appeared to be a strategy um, of drawing down uh, US commitments and avoiding new commitments, precisely, as I say, to, to recover from the conflicts that America was in and to concentrate on a rising peer competitor in China. Um, remembering that a, a great power, which is at the same time an economic competitor on the same level and possibly even going ahead of America in the year in qu quite soon, uh, is something that you, the United States has not faced for 130 years, you know, since the 1880s. I mean, this is something seriously new. Uh, the other thing um, about uh, China, of course, is that, um, and this is a point that I will come back to with regard to Russia, um, that although it's quite true that uh, China <coughs> cannot remotely challenge the US militarily on the world stage, even to a considerable degree, actually, economically, if one looks at you know, trade and finance and so forth, it can do so in its own backyard, in its own literal, in East Asia. Um, and of course, uh, it has been uh, a central part of American strategic doctrine for the best, better part of a century now that no hostile or potentially hostile great power should be able to dominate either the Atlantic or the Pacific literal facing the United States and thereby exclude the United States from Eurasia. And there, China does seem to have perhaps a much stronger chance. In other words, China does not have to defeat the American Navy in the Atlantic Ocean or even in the Pacific Ocean. It only has to do so in its own waters. Um, and that is a, a very serious threat and one which is taken very seriously um, by the US uniform military. And so, uh, you know, the, the Obama administration did not, of course, formally abandon, uh, but uh, shelved um, permanent, as far as one could see, permanently, uh, the, uh, the whole idea of taking Georgia and Ukraine into NATO um, has, as we all know, tried, done its best to avoid getting into conflicts elsewhere or has pushed other countries forward to take the lead um, in Libya, uh, certainly did not want um, to, to get militarily involved in Syria and in the end, um, you know, jumped at the opportunity given by Russia to avoid that, and so forth, and, and ultimately has moved, is now trying to move towards um, a resolution of the Iranian nuclear issue, 
um, through negotiation with Iran, and is, of course, withdrawing from Afghanistan, and so on. Uh, <coughs> and, um, you know, since I reckon that the, the European Union, with all its internal problems and its general lack of any strategy and, um, uh, well, of course, lack of money in recent years, given, you know, problems in uh, Spain, in Greece and elsewhere, did not seem to be in an ambitious mood, I thought that I could sort of safely ignore the former Soviet Union and concentrate on Pakistan, Afghanistan, and so on. Well, <laughs> how wrong I was. Uh, I came back from Afghanistan last November to find that we Europeans, we don't even need the Americans to get ourselves into messes anymore. We can do it on our own. Quite amazing, I have to say. Um, and what I think this does uh, illustrate uh, is that, that the European Union is not cannot be and will never be uh, a, um, a, a strategic force in the world. Um, you know, it cannot formulate a, a, a strategy by its very nature. Um, because as far as I can see, I mean, what happened with... Uh, let us face one thing absolutely clearly. There is no intention of ever bringing Ukraine into the European Union. That was never a serious plan. That was never discussed. If that had been put seriously to Western parliaments and electorates prior to last summer, it would have been rejected out of hand. I mean, look, in two generations, who knows? One should never say never. But it was not part of any plan by the European Union, in part because of a clear recognition in private that... Romania and Bulgaria had been brought in far too early, and as a result, um, had, uh, the European Union had lost its ability uh, to influence internal reform, uh, to shape anti-corruption in these countries, because once they're in, one's ability to change things diminishes radically. In these circumstances, and given this recognition, the idea of bringing Ukraine into the European Union, madness. Other things... Um, <coughs> As I'm sure you know, England in particular, I say England advisedly, not Britain, is in an extremely anxious state at the moment um, over immigration from Eastern Europe. Um, Poland and other countries in the past, but now very much Romania as well. There are more than three million Ukrainian citizens working legally in Russia today, completely legally, and can rise to the highest positions. How many Ukrainian citizens are working legally in the European Union today? Perhaps a tenth of that figure? Possibly considerably less. Illegally is a different matter. Um, but then they're working in illegal professions, one in particular. Um, any thought of bringing, of, of uh, allowing three million Ukrainians to move to, or possibly many more, uh, to move to Western Europe uh, would involve uh, in the forthcoming referendum in Britain, Britain leaving the European Union. Um, now, it may be, and I speak with due modesty as a, a British citizen, uh, that the European Union might well feel, given Britain's record, that that would be a good exchange, um, get rid of Britain and bring in Ukraine. Others might say that perhaps that was not such a good exchange. But the point is that this was never considered. What seems to have happened last summer is that particular U uh, European countries, for particular historical reasons, and two individuals in particular, pushed within the European Commission and it, in Brussels for a pretty meaningless association agreement, which everybody knew, everybody in private knew, that Yanukovych was not going to fulfill the conditions of that association agreement and that it was not actually going to go in, 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 you know, any further, that it was going to remain another formal exercise in, you know, of, of the kind which the European Union has had with Ukraine in the past, um, which was not going to lead to a European path. I mean, was perhaps going to nudge Ukraine a little bit down, you know, down that path, uh, but not... Um, not put, put Ukraine onto anything like, you know, the path 
to European membership. And the intention of this was not, in fact, to do that. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a purely strategic move uh, to block the Russian government's hopes of taking Ukraine into the Eurasian Union. So it was an attempt to frustrate a Russian strategy. Now, whether or not that made sense in the abstract strategically um, is a wider question. But what I think we do need to recognize is that if you are going to engage in that kind of strategy in the former Soviet Union, then you need to be serious about it. You need to, to, to think this through. And the idea that one can engage in this while completely refusing to negotiate with Russia on the subject uh, indicates a lack of strategic foresight and thought, um, which, as I say, I mean, essentially disqualifies the European Union as a, as a strategic actor. Uh, because, as far as I can make out, there was, in fact, no, no effort at all to negotiate with Russia or to think through the consequences of any of this. And as, as I, I'm sure you know, um, Romano Prodi has suggested that it might have been possible, actually, to negotiate some form of scaled-down association agreement um, with the European Union and a scaled-down Ukrainian uh, membership, uh, reducing Ukrainian membership of the Eurasian Union from membership to association. See, in other words, if the two offers could be made compatible. And um, apparently, I have this from European sources as well as Russian ones, uh, there were no less than three suggestions from Lavrov, from the, the Russian government, to negotiate on this, all of them ignored uh, by the European Union. Uh, and so, of course, we initiated, well, we and the Russians initiated uh, last year something which r really, y y you know, is, is, is not difficult to understand about Ukraine. And so many people have written this about Ukraine since independence. And I wrote it in a, a short book which came out in 1999 called Ukraine and Russia a fraternal rivalry, <coughs> which is that because of Ukrainian history, because of the, the nature of uh, Ukrainian society, Ukraine is a country which cannot be forced to choose categorically between the West and Russia without tearing itself apart. And that is, of course, precisely what we have seen. And the, the thing is that the, um, this is very evident, uh, both from elections in Ukraine ever since independence, which have seen essentially very s you know, small moves in the center involving a few percent between forces which are not... Uh, the, the thing is that people are now talking about pro-Western or pro-European forces and pro-Russian forces. And of course, now that fighting has begun, things are beginning to look more and more like this. But actually, if you look at the history, of Ukraine um, since independence. Well, a cynical way of looking at this is that both sides of Ukrainian politics, or perhaps one should rather say all sides of Ukrainian politics, because it's not just two-sided, um, have basically uh, tried to um, get as much financial help as possible. And in the case of the West, you know, invitations to nice conferences and international hotels. In the case of Russia, of course, subsidized gas and so forth get things from both sides while doing as little in return for either as possible. Um, but ideologically, too, um, the great majority of the forces which have been seen, which have been presented as pro-Russian in Ukraine, uh, at least until recently, and we really do not know what a majority of people in the Donbass think, certainly there is, I, there is no reason to take this referendum serious. I mean, well, we have to take it seriously because it has created a, a day or helped create a de facto power on the ground. But we certainly shouldn't, uh, shouldn't think that this uh, accurately reflects, you know, what a majority of the people in the Donbass think. One would have to have, obviously, uh, a mu an internationally observed, legitimate 
electoral process or referendum there to know that. But in the past, the great majority of the people who were presented as pro-Russian in Ukraine wanted to have good relations with Russia, but certainly did not want to join the Russian Federation or partition Ukraine. Um, even in Belarus, that, that's true of the Belarusian government. They want to have an alliance with Russia, not the same thing at all as joining Russia. But you know, on our side too, um, a lot of the people we call pro-Western are not pro-Western. They are Ukrainian nationalists, in some cases Ukrainian fascists. They may want our help against Russia. That does not mean that they accept Western values and Western democracy. And I think that is, I'll come back to that a bit later, extremely apparent if you know their, their propaganda, if you know their tradition. Um, so the, 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 there has been actually a, a large middle ground in Ukraine, which, for example, has favored closer relations with the European Union, but always, by the way, this is important to note, Britain and America were urging uh, NATO membership on a country which, according to every opinion poll, voted more than two to one against NATO membership. Every single poll, every single survey, showed more than two-thirds of Ukrainians as opposed to NATO membership for the perfectly obvious reason that they knew that this would tear the country apart and drastically worsen their security situation. And, of course, they also, no doubt, had a very good idea at heart that, in the end, this was meaningless because we wouldn't fight them, that it would not impact us in terms of putting us for a crisis, what we are not going to do. Um, so we, we headed into this process in which, um, you know, we, we, we and the Russians last autumn began essentially to, to, to pull Ukraine in two. Um, now, one thing to, to, to note perhaps here, because it, it is of crucial importance, um, you know, th there is all this talk now that, you know, r Russia is, is stronger than... The, the, the West, that, you know, Russia has a strategy in Ukraine and, uh, and we don't. But another way of, of saying this is simply to say that Ukraine is much, much more important for Russia than it is for us. Um, there isn't a, 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 I'm certainly not a member of the Russian parliament, and precious few uh, school children uh, in um, in Russia, who can't find Ukraine on a map? Well, partly because, of course, any map of Russia has to show bits of Ukraine. How many U.S. congressmen do you suppose could find Ukraine on a map? I mean, except the ones who are particularly enthralled to the the Polish diaspora. Um, I, I won't speak for Italian school children, or, um, but you see my point. Ukraine for us is peripheral, utterly peripheral. It's a long way away. In, in, in every way. It isn't for Russia, it's central. And the inability to understand this and to draw consequences, these are not moral consequences, these are practical consequences. <laughs> if a country is very, very important to you, you will risk things, including in the last resort war for a vital interest. You will risk things, you will make sacrifices which you will not make for something which is peripheral. And part of the problem, you see, I think, uh, is that, and, and this goes to the heart of the problem of, of European Union strategy, um, that Europe the strategy of the European Union has been largely made uh, by the one European country for whom Ukraine is not peripheral, for, for whom Ukraine, in a certain sense, for historical reasons and emotional reasons, is a bit like Ukraine for Russia. Um, and that country is, of course, Poland. Uh, from time to time, perhaps, it might have been necessary or useful to point out to the Poles that they are, after all, only one member of the European Union uh, and not, um, you know, the whole Union. And, uh, and the rest of us have essentially, to a great extent, been dragged along <laughs> behind this. Uh, and so we sort of stumbled into this crisis in Ukraine. Now, I think from this point of view, and from the point of view of vital as opposed to peripheral interests, there is one thing which is, is, is worth pointing out, because along with a great many other things that I will mention, it has been utterly obscured in, in, in the Western media, which is that 
Uh, we have put ourselves in a position, yes, uh, in which we are suffering considerable humiliation. Um, the European Union, as I say, is, is, has become a kind of joke in strategic terms. Uh, the Americans are looking bad. You know, they've been, on one hand, massively distracted from China. Uh, as, I, uh, as I say to my students, um, especially coming back from Pakistan, which, as some of you may know, is the conspiracy theory capital of the universe. I used to think that Russia was, but, oh, the Pakistanis just leave the Russians standing. So if I were a conspiracy theorist, which I'm not, but if I were, um, I, I would say that actually, and not just in, in Ukraine, but that by far the in, uh, in the Middle East, certainly, in fact, the greater part of American strategy over the past um, 12 years uh, has actually been made, uh, designed by a, a committee of wise old men meeting in secret in Beijing. Um, the only country that this has favored is China. <laughs> and it, if, if you look at what's, you know, the present state of US relations with Russia and European relations with Russia, it really is quite remarkable. The two things that the Chinese lack um, above all in the world are serious allies. And um, incidentally, the, 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 the lack of China's, of serious allies for the Chinese is absolutely demonstrated by the fact that they regard Pakistan as a key ally. Yes, I mean, you know, not, not the country that you choose if you have, you know, more serious and reliable allies. But the second thing, China's great strategic weakness, and this is something you feel very strongly, of course, if you visit India, is, of course, its dependence on external sources of energy, above all by sea. By, of course, driving the Russians into the arms of the Chinese, we are solving two of their key problems at one go. Um, they can get their gas from Russia if we don't buy it anymore. And, of course, they have uh, actually, uh, you know, um, not a world power anymore, but a very serious regional power as an ally if, you know, if we continue in this line. And, um, and I should say on that score, by the way, that um, it, it's a striking thing that, uh, as I say, a, a, a considerable force for moderation in Washington these days. Qu quite contrary to, you know, the what was true in the past or, you know, what is still perhaps a, a left-wing image of the United States. But a real force for moderation in the United States in recent years has been the U.S. uniform military for the reasons that I've set out. But the problem is that they only seem to be able to kick in when a crisis has already started. They don't seem to be configured in order to, to stop the U.S. from getting into messes. Um, don't get me started on the subject of the U.S. Congress, um, but anyway. Uh, so we, we, we stumble into this, um, th this tug of war with Russia. And, now this is very important, Russia suffers a crushing defeat. A crushing defeat. Please keep this in mind. The, the, the Russian government, and I will note... I will always try to say the Russian government and not Putin. Because one of the mistakes that the media, but governments too, have made is this endless Putin, Putin, Putin. This trivialization, this per personalization of Russian policy into one man. Leading, of course, in turn to these uh, discussions which would be comical if they did not have... a. <coughs> A, a, a tone of wickedness about them. Uh, the discussions of whether Putin is insane, whether Putin has gone mad. Something which, by the way, as a Brit, is so reminiscent of history. Every religious figure in, in, the, in the world who resisted the British Empire in the 19th century, and actually to the middle of the 20th century, was automatically dubbed mad by, by the, the British government and media. But of course, anyone who resists Britain and Britain's civilizing mission in the world must be mad. The discussion of Putin's insanity has been very much along those lines. The actual truth of the matter is that on these issues, Putin has been leading, but also representing, a consensus of the Russian establishment for reasons which are deeply rooted, not just in Russia's history, culture and so forth, but also in what have been seen from a realist and not just a strategic but an economic perspective to be vital interests of the Russian state. Uh, in terms of a, the Eurasian Union, that the world is dividing itself up or is being divided up into great economic blocks. 
The United States is, after all, trying to do this in order to isolate China with its Pacific partnership, now its Euro-Atlantic partnership, and so then Russia is facing the extremely uncomfortable situation of becoming peripheral, both to China and to the, 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 the Western economies, and therefore believes that to maintain any kind of sphere of economic activity for itself, guaranteed markets, it needs to build up an economic block around itself. And of that, Ukraine is by far the most important member, or hopeful member. Now, this is what I mean about a crushing defeat. We could lose Ukraine, and it would make no difference to the basic strengths or weaknesses of the West. It, it would be humiliating, yes, but we've survived worse humiliations. What has been proved in recent months is that the Russian government's hopes for a serious Eurasian Union are dead, dead as a nail, because they've been killed in Ukraine, because it has been demonstrated uh, that you simply cannot bring Ukraine as a whole, uh, or indeed most of Ukraine, into a Russian-dominated Eurasian Union or any other bloc, because very large numbers of Ukrainians will literally fight to the death to prevent that, as the demonstrators in, in Kiev showed. So Ru Russia has, def has suffered a, a crushing defeat on a critical point, something which, once again, has been completely obscured in the Western discussion. <laughs> Crimea is a, a very small consolation prize compared to that. As for the Donbass, if I may, uh, a slightly personal note, um, my great-grandfather owned a large part of what's now Donetsk and sold it in the 1870s to a Welsh mining engineer, Thomas Hughes, because he couldn't stand the place. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not asking to have you, uh, the Donbass back, you understand, but my point is, the Donbass, the Donbass as a great geopolitical prize? I mean, give me a break. <sighs> anyway, so first thing, Russia, as, as a result of what happens, suffers uh, a very serious defeat. But... The problem is, you see, that the way in which this happened, um, not it, 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 especially the four, the, the, the four days after the agreement, or less than four, three, um, uh, after the agreement for new elections, you know, and so forth and so on at the end of, uh, of February. But the way in which Yanukovych was overthrown, um, you know, by... Uh, street demonstrations, spearheaded, it must be said, to a considerable extent, by extreme nationalist groups, and with, you know, as a result of that intercepted telephone conversation, an obvious manifest hand of the United States, you know, in bringing this about, was bound to create uh, a very harsh Russian reaction. It was bound to. Um, and, of course, the overthrow in this way of an elected government um, also, by definition, legitimizes extra, whatever one to call it, extra democratic street action elsewhere. And there is nothing surprising about this. Every revolution of this kind that I know of has led to attempts at counter-revolution elsewhere from the French Revolution on. It's bound to, because why the hell, you know, be sensible. Why the hell should people sitting in, in Donetsk, having seen you know, demonstrators oust an elected government in Kiev, not do the same themselves, to unelected governments, unelected regional governments, appointed regional governments from Kiev in their own areas. You know, this, this is, I mean, simply a green light. Um, so, uh, and what I think, you know, I mean, it, it, what all this demonstrates is, uh, I mean, the European Union completely lost control of the process. First, you know, to the demonstrations on the ground, but then, of course, to Victoria Newland and other US officials, you know, who are clearly pursuing uh, a, a radical agenda. But you see, the interesting thing is that I all of this, I I in a way, seems to indicate a loss of control from Washington as well. Or if not a loss of control, at least in certain circumstances, the United States essentially going on autopilot 
you know, it's simply pursuing what has become a fixed script for overthrowing pro-Russian governments, even elected ones. And then you see the problem is there's a, there's a very good um, <coughs> a, a article by an Israeli journalist in Haaretz. I think I put the reference on the, 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 the piece that I, I sent to you, pointing out that the US then, then actually just began to lie um, prop propagandistically. Uh, of course, meeting Russian lies as, as well on the other side, but instead of actually trying to um, you know, t take an objective line, digging itself into a position where it had to lie and lie and lie, on two points especially. One, this extraordinary line from Washington, uh, that Yanukovych left power voluntarily, you know, that, that he quit power. And also power, you know, the presidency was just lying around, uh, he ran away for no reason, and so of course these, you know, legitimate other forces had to come in. I mean, that is a lie which approaches the Soviet um, in its difference from you know, any kind of observable reality or rationality. And the second is, of course, to deny um, that there are u extreme Ukrainian nationalist forces uh, involved in what's happened. I'll, I'll come back to those points um, in a second. Meanwhile, what is the European Union doing? Well, I have to say, now this is a specifically French thing, but then France, of course, once upon a time, uh, under de Gaulle and his immediate successors, and really even up to President Sarkozy in certain respects, which must have been, oh, I don't know, a century or two ago, um, regarded itself as the serious diplomatic power in Europe, you know, the, uh, a, a country which, you know, at least arrogated to itself um, the, um, the role of, of shaping, you know, a European policy. Um, and, and because France, you know, also understood diplomacy and the way that, you know, we crude Anglo-Saxons and, and pathetic Germans did not. Did, did you read the story this morning about the French? So c continuing with their plans to, to build and sell these, these amphibious ships to Russia um, for deployment in the Black Sea, uh, which, by the way, would, would if, if, God forbid, Russia ever did decide to do so at some point in future, would, would of course, be an enormous help in, in Russia to seize Odessa or Nikolaev or other Ukrainian ports. And the French are going ahead with this sale. The French are going ahead, it seems, with this sale. Well, now, that, may, that might make sense if a Fr you know, as a result of a French policy, which... You know, basically was following a completely Gaullist line of French national interest, but coupled, you know, with a diplomatic strategy of France as an independent great power, seeking un politique à tous azimut, you know, all, and, and um, Europe to the Urals, so in other words, really seeking good relations with Russia. But what have we seen? We see France continuing this, this policy towards Russia, basically in order to make money, nothing else, while on the other hand, just limping helplessly, it seems, behind uh, American policy. There has been no attempt to, um, to formulate an, an independent French line, although the French perhaps are now giving some support to the, 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 the present German efforts. But, well, look, I mean, look, look okay, let, let's, let's, be, let's be kind to Monsieur Hollande. Um, he has had other things on his mind recently. It's also, uh, I, I always uh, feel that um, there's, uh, you know, the media, and I speak as a former journalist, are, are, are also heavily to blame for this. Because in the past, when French presidents went to visit their mistresses, of course, well, originally they went in carriages, and then they went in limousines, and so they could read their state papers as they go along. Much more difficult, of course, to read state papers on the back of a scooter, and, and of course, wearing a helmet. Um, you can imagine, you know, secret French documents flying in all directions along the road. <laughs> so, all right, one understands the difficulties of French policy, but all the same, this is a little bit odd. Uh, now, as you will understand from what I've said um, so far, I'm certainly not advocating that France, uh, well, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, even if they plan to go on with this sale eventually. I mean, they, they, they might perhaps have discovered, I, I don't know, a, a problem with electricity in the shipyards concerned, or at least something to 
send some kind of signal. Um, but I'm certainly not advocating at this stage um, uh, taking uh, sanctions against Russia further. Well, first of all, uh, yeah, I mean, there's no point in taking sanctions against Russia further than have been uh, done at present, because it's quite clear they won't have any result. You know, the, the Russian policy is now, to a great extent, fixed. And what one, one must always keep in mind when it comes to this idea of ratcheting up uh, pressure on Russia is where, in the end, do you stop? Well, we know where we stop. We stop because we won't fight. Now, we think, and I think with good reason, that Russia w um, won't fight either or would only fight in the very last resort. But you do understand, here we are betting a doubt against a certainty. And that is not a good idea, uh, either in gambling or in, in, in strategy. Um, so, as, as a result of this lack of, well, two things it must be said. First, of course, yes, Russia's annexation of Crimea, which I su should say clearly I regard both as a, uh, as a crime under international law and as a very serious mistake from Russia's point of view, um, which has actually weakened considerably, Russia's position both internationally uh, and um, within Ukraine. Uh, because, for example, in these, as, as has been widely pointed out, in Ukrainian presidential elections, when or if they ever happen, um, Russia has taken a, a, a couple of million vo you know, pro-Russian voters out of the Ukrainian elections, which was stupid. It was also unnecessary because, as the Russians demonstrated, they could have taken effective control of Crimea without annexing the place. But anyway, and of course the furore that this caused um, delayed serious negotiations essentially about the rest of Ukraine. Uh, but it has also been um, the fact that you know, we, we have only, or the Germans, I shouldn't say we, come round to a recognition of the obvious uh, when it comes to a settlement in Ukraine, more than two months after this was in fact obvious, I would say, to, to any intelligent and informed observer. And that is that if there is to be a political settlement in Ukraine, it has to be along federal lines. The only way out of this now is a federal Ukraine. If we had proposed this, or if the Germans or if somebody sensible had proposed this um, in March, then we could have perhaps headed off the actions on the ground in, in eastern Ukraine. But of course, by insisting on early presidential elections, and by the way, in circumstances where, you know, given the situation in Kiev, given the Maidan, given the ascendancy of radical nationalist forces elsewhere, there are good reasons you know, to wonder whether these elections could be f fully free and fair. This was an invitation to Russia and to pro-Russian forces on, uh, in eastern Ukraine to establish facts on the ground. Uh, because talking to Western diplomats, the, the line that you were hearing in March and April and essentially until a week ago was, oh, you know, we, um, we, we can't uh, negotiate under pressure. You know, yes, of course, one could talk perhaps about a federal constitution in future, but we can't do this as long as you know, Russia is threatening. And in any case, this is a matter for the Ukrainians themselves. Essentially, it's a matter for the Ukrainian government. Well, this was just not serious, I'm afraid. This was not a serious approach to the realities in Ukraine. And above all, this is not how the West has approached divided societies which have experienced revolutions and which are uh, undergoing a threat of ethnic conflict. That is not how we've approached it elsewhere. The standard approach is that, of course, you have to have a comprehensive agreement before you can have elections. Um, and there was no way in the end uh, that um, Russia was going to accept a rubber-stamped new Ukrainian order um, with no guarantees for its position and for the position of Russian speakers and ethnic Russians uh, in Ukraine. Um, so uh, we, lost, um, we lost more than two months. Um, and now, well, if you look at the Western position and the position of the Western media, uh, there is still this um, insistence uh, that uh, there have to be presidential elections 
uh, um, in less than two weeks from now. Uh, I fear that, you know, by making these statements, we are digging ourselves further and further and further into elections. With every statement of this kind, it makes it more difficult to postpone the elections. But I regard this as a really serious mistake. Um, because if we, you know, if we, in return for Russia not, of course, recognizing the referendum uh, and the new authorities in the Donbass, um, in return essentially for a standstill agreement there, uh, in return for Russia's participation in talks on the constitution for Ukraine as a whole, as a whole, well, except for Crimea, which is lost, let's face it. I mean, and sanctions against Russia over Crimea must remain, but this is like northern Cyprus. We're not going to get Crimea back. Um, I think that uh, if there is to be a settlement, uh, the elections have to be postponed, and there have to be new, uh, the presidential elections and Ukrainian parliamentary elections have to take place under a new constitution simultaneously uh, with regional elections. And all of them have to be under uh, international supervision. Now, my hope is that if we can get an agreement on that, and I think it's a, it, it, it's a reasonable hope, um, that gives Russia enough. Um, and incidentally, you know, m many of the, the, you know, the, the opposition to this in the West is that th this will give Russia a veto over Ukraine's Western path. No, it won't. What it will do is establish something that we have recognized in Northern Ireland, in India, elsewhere, is that in deeply divided societies, you cannot have existential decisions for the society as a whole made just by simple majorities. There has to be a consensus. And by the way, this is also, of course, the principle on which the US Senate works for really critical decisions, um, you have to have a two-thirds majority. There is nothing wrong with that in, in, um, in democratic terms. But on the other hand, I, I do believe and hope that if you can have democratic elections in Ukraine, that this will in fact be the way uh, of um, disarming and removing from power uh, I have to say yes. I mean, it will lead, um, given uh, what seems to be their very limited uh, popular support, it will on the one hand uh, lead to the removal from power of Ukrainian extreme nationalist groups like Svoboda, which at present have a role in the Ukrainian government out of all proportion to their, uh, to their support in Ukrainian society. But on the other hand, it should lead, if we have elections under international supervision, regional elections in eastern Ukraine, the hope is that this will take power out of the hands of the armed militias who have seized it. Who's, I mean, if I know anything about that area, I don't think that the mass of the population is going to vote for these you know, armed thugs. I think they're going to go back to voting for more or less sleepy and corrupt Ukrainian, yes, I mean, ex-communist and pro-Russian, but still politicians. It will return power from the streets to the political process. Um, I hope, but I also think that this is the only way of doing that. If we continue to hold presidential elections in present circumstances, we'll confirm in power the existing forces in the Donbass, because they simply will not recognize it. Um, the elections will not take place in any credible way in, in eastern Ukraine. And that will, that will dig further the, um, the, the, the split. It will move the Donbass further towards full separation. I don't think that Russia will annex it uh, or recognize it as an independent state or anything, but we will have another situation like Abkhazia, South Ossetia, like Nagorno-Karabakh, but on a much larger scale a much larger and more dangerous scale, which will bedevil the politics of Europe for a generation to come. And, as of course we saw in August 2008, could well lead to another war a decade or more down the line. Now, I've used up almost all my time, uh, but um, maybe just quickly, one, one, or two, one, one or two things in, 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 in parting. Speaking as a former journalist, the, 
it, it has struck me for many years now, um, it, with regard to Russia, that much of the Western media, and to some extent prompted by government, particularly in the United States, but also to a considerable extent uh, just sort of operating, if you like, from within, from its own attitudes and its sort of inherited bigotries and traditions, has taken the line towards Russia that in any crisis or dispute, the task of most of the Western media is not uh, an attempt at objective analysis, or even, I'm sorry to say, in many cases, objective reporting, but is essentially to meet lying Russian propaganda, and yes, of course, Russian propaganda very often is mendacious, but to meet lying Russian propaganda with lying propaganda of our own. And I'm talking here of the media, not of states. To give you one example, um, from Chechnya, which I covered, you know, as a journalist, the first Chechen war. The Russians uh, alleged um, from uh, very early on in the first war uh, that the enemy, that the Chechen side, uh, had a, a major component of international Islamist terrorists and extremists. Now, initially, that was not true in the first war. The Chechen side was overwhelmingly nationalist, Dudayev, Maskadov not Basayev, perhaps. Uh, and the, the, the response was to deny that. But the great majority of the Western media went on denying that after it had become absolutely apparent that, yes, a very powerful international Islamist force linked to Al-Qaeda had arrived in Chechnya, and by the way, was declaring itself in English on the internet. It had its own website, kokaz.net, totally ignored. Because it was felt, and I've talked to journalists about that, that if you, if you reported on this, you were somehow supporting Russian propaganda. And I said, no, look, your duty as a journalist is to report the truth, not to meet one propaganda with an opposing propaganda. Um, and as a result, by the way, um, the presentation of Russian reasons for going into the Second Chechen War was drastically, drastically skewed. Um, Similarly, um, Russia alleged uh, um, that, kid that kidnappings you know, and, and banditry from Chechnya assassinations were rendering, the, you know, were a threat to the entire region. The West ignored those totally, ignored them to such an extent that Western populations had no idea of the scale of this threat in the late 1990s because they weren't told about it. Well, in the case of, of Ukraine, I mean, there have been some really very, very striking omissions. Um, now, I can't speak for the Italian media. I, I used to know Italian, but I yeah, faded long ago, alas. Uh, but certainly, speaking for the American media and much, of, though not all, of the British media, um, a number of extraordinary things. Um, one is, I, I don't know how many of you knew this, but in mid-February, you know, the, 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 the line for several weeks it's now changing has been that you know the, uh, the autonomy for the donbass is unacceptable that federalization is highly highly doubtful and that you know for a long time really we we refuse to accept this in mid february lviv the the region of western ukraine itself declared autonomy from ukraine <laughs> declared uh, well declared a plan for autonomy from from Ukraine. Why? Well, because, of course, they thought that Yanukovych was going to stay in power, and therefore they wanted, you know, to separate themselves from that and give them at least the option of moving closer towards the West. Well, so they could do that in February, but the Donbass can't do it today. Why not? Well, of course, because, well, we have chosen to believe that Galicia is pro-European and the Donbass is pro-Russian. There is no other reason than that to make any distinction there. But the main point is that has not been reported. It has not been reported what happened, you know, this, th this move in Galicia in, um, in mid-February. Even more shocking uh, is the, and uh, once again, I do strongly advise you to look at this Haritz piece, which is very good and objective, is this bi business of turning a blind eye uh, to extreme nationalist groups in, in in Ukraine. 
And uh, the lack, for example, of reporting of... Uh, how, I wonder how many of you know the, uh, the European um, Parliament resolution of December um, 2012, uh, in which... Sorry, did I um, bring it along? Um, so I'm looking for my... Oh, yes. Uh, December the 13th, 2012, after the last Ukrainian elections, um, the European Parliament, talking of Svoboda, you know, the, the Ukrainian extreme nationalist party, which now has five ministries, I think, in the, in the government, including the secretaryship of the National Security Council. Listen to this. Members of the European Parliament voice concerns about the rising nationalistic sentiment in Ukraine, which led to the election of the Svoboda Party to the Parliament of Ukraine. The European Parliament recalls that racist, anti-Semitic and xenophobic views go against the European Union's fundamental values and principles, and it appeals to pro-democratic parties in the Ukrainian Parliament not to associate with, endorse or form coalitions with this party. You can find that on... European Union website. Now, how exactly did we find ourselves immediately extending recognition to a Ukrainian government which came to power in the way that it did and which includes a party like this? Well, one of the reasons is that this kind of thing has not been reported. So a great majority of European members of parliament, even members of government, of course, simply do not know this. They don't know it. Uh, about this, this aspect of things in Ukraine. <coughs> Which means, of course, that the... Well, I'm sorry to say this, but people in the Donbass might say that only by taking up arms and seizing buildings were they ever going to gain the attention of the West, that nothing else, no other expressions of their concerns about this government, uh, this new government, were actually going to... To, to gain any attention. Now, I think that's exaggerated. I don't think that, you know, obviously Svoboda was not about to march into Donbass and establish a fascistic dictatorship. But the point is that, look, <laughs> Russia is Russia, and I don't expect much of it, frankly, in terms of democratic and objective internal discussion. But I do, as a former journalist, expect that of our media, and above all, if our governments and parliaments are to make realistic policies, I'm not talking about morality here, but I'm talking about policies which will actually recognize the facts on the ground and acknowledge what the sentiments of people may be, it is essential that they be accurately informed, and I'm afraid that they are not being. Now, once again, I can't speak for the Italian media, but a third thing, for example, because I was in, in the United States, when um, you, you, you may have seen this, this film of Svoboda activists beating up on camera the head of Ukrainian state television and forcing him to sign his resignation in front of the cameras. This was filmed. I was in the US at the time. It wasn't shown by any of the leading American television channels. Not one. Why not? Well, presumably because, once again, this would spoil the message. This would spoil the message of our democratic Ukraine against Russia's wicked Soviet communist stooges. You see, it's... I mean, this is si sinister stuff in a democracy, frankly. You know, if, uh, uh, because as they say, garbage in, garbage out. If our governments, if our parliaments, let alone our wretched electorates, are not being given basic information which goes against a propagandist narrative, then they are by definition incapable of formulating not just objective but realistic policies in the countries concerned. So, um, yeah, here we are. Uh, I hope very much that this present German initiative um, will work. I certainly think that a federal Ukraine is now the only way out of the present mess. Um, that it will either be a federal Ukraine or it will be a, a partitioned Ukraine, or of course, at some stage, uh, it will be a, uh, I mean, a, a partitioned Ukraine, not just in the Donbass, uh, but it will be a Ukraine de destroyed by, by civil war. Um, I think that we still have a, a chance of avoiding that, um, but we have left it very late, um, and to 
to, to give a real chance of success, as I say, I believe that uh, we will almost certainly uh, have to postpone the presidential elections uh, due for the 25th. Uh, if we do that, I still think that um, Ukraine can be salvaged. Uh, I certainly think that it is our duty as Europeans um, to do this, uh, given that it is to a great extent our own fecklessness um, which has got the Ukraine um, and to some extent the world into this mess. Thank you. Thank you, Anatole, for your really insightful lecture. Really interesting. Now move to the questions and answers session. Who wants to start with the first with the first question? Here, Adaman. Massimiliano Bajoli, my name. <coughs> I didn't understand uh, probably very well why uh, do you think uh, Victoria Newland act the way she acted? Thank you. I, I would say that, I, you know, I mentioned the word autopilot. Um, the, I, I lived for seven years in, in, in Washington and there is a a, a remarkable degree <laughs> to which U United States policy runs on, if you like, tram lines in certain respects. Um, that is especially true if there is essentially a bipartisan consensus on certain things. As I'm afraid, in Washington, there is basically a bipartisan consensus on hostility to Russia and support for anti-Russian and quote-unquote you know, democratic movements. Uh, and if there is no, uh, if there is no um, pressure from the uniform military uh, to, to stop a given process, as I, I mentioned, there has been on, on certain cases. But um, that tends to be, you see, that tends to be, uh, b by, by nature, and of course quite legitimately, areas where, where there is a real question of military action. So you know, I talked about Georgia in August 2008, an attack on Iran. The American you know, General Dempsey and others have gone out to tell Israel very strongly you know, also not to attack Iran you know, in, in the hope of dragging America in. But absent any of those things, um, you have a, you know, a whole set of institutions. You have the Congress, which can be relied on you know, to support this. You have a great many people, not all by any means, but a great many people within the State Department, particularly people like Newland who are um, bipartisan. You know, her husband is a leading neoconservative, but she herself is a, was a Clinton I mean, I mean, a Hillary Clinton choice. And then, you know, so, so these things, you know, you, you can have a policy which essentially develops a juggernaut-like impetus. Um, and if the president himself does not intervene, and it probably have to be the president himself to rein this in, then, then people will simply work, it seems, by a, by a kind of script, by a, by a playbook. You know, the, 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 to be fair, I mean, the, the, the other thing is one should always recognise that people were also being dragged along by the progress of events, you know, on the ground, you know, the demonstrations. Um, but certainly, I mean, the, 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 the way in which the US at the very least appears to have gone along with the destruction of an agreement that the European Union and the US itself had endorsed and Russia had accepted. Um, well, let, let me put it this way. Y you see, the, the, the other problem in, in the United States is that there is an astonishing, I mean, it's true, I suppose, everywhere, but uh, uh, perhaps especially in America, um, a quite astonishing inability uh, to recognize any comparison, to think of any comparison between what other countries do 
and what the United States would do in a particular case. Well, I think we all know very well what the United States would do in a similar case. If it saw uh, you know, an allied government being overthrown by street protests, le led by people who could very well be presented as extremists, the United States would never recognize such a government, never, not in a hundred years, and would indeed do everything possible to subvert and overthrow it. But that is simply, you, you see, that, that, that kind of thing re um, receives no recognition. But I, I shouldn't really say this about the, the United States. Um, it was a French diplomat in 1992, 1992, prior to the role of France in, the, in Rwanda, about which so much has been written, and other places as well. It was a French diplomat, apropos of Russia, who informed me that spheres of influence are simply morally unacceptable at the end of the 20th century. It was a British diplomat based in Kiev, um, so one must make certain excuses, um, but who told me, <coughs> or said to me in the 1990s, he asked rhetorically the question, <coughs> apropos of Sevastopol, of course, um, <coughs> when I is Russia going to get over this ridiculous obsession with meaningless overseas naval bases? That sounds even better if, a, if, if a, a, a British diplomat would say it in Spanish, of course. Um, I don't have anything to add to uh, your talk. I hope you publish it soon, and I've been reading your article, so I didn't have anything to ask on that side. Uh, instead, I had a retrospective question concerning uh, your earlier book on Chechnya, which contains two chapters called The Failure of the Serbian Option, and particularly the second chapter, which I reread recently. Yeah. Would you change or update anything on that? There's actually a specific reference yeah. to Crimea. Yeah. That's it. Yes, indeed. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, and um, well, I think uh, I, I should say that, that what I meant by the Serbian option. Uh, <coughs> Sorry? Oh. Uh, what I meant by the Serbian option was uh, a mobilization by Russia of ethnic militias in neighboring states, or indeed on Russia's own soil in the Caucasus. Because I saw how in both Chechen wars, you know, the, the attempt by Cossack forces to become involved, you know, local ethnic militias were very firmly pushed aside by the Russian armed forces. Uh, and how, um, you know, in, um, in, in Crimea, uh, the Russians had never, you, you know, did not support previously the, the, um, the, the, the creation of such forces. Well, uh, I, I suppose the, the answer is um, that <coughs> as long uh, uh, as Russia uh, felt that it had a reasonably friendly regime in power in Kiev, e even you know, for, for four years, the Timoshenko administration, which was, you know, certainly much more distanced from Russia, but, you know, did, did not present itself as, you know, actively hostile. Um, and, and as long as the Ukrainian process was, uh, you know, democratic and constitutional for all the sort of hiccup of 2004, the colored revolution, um, Russia was, you know, did, did not uh, adopt um, this option. Uh, but, but, of course, um, yeah, I mean, once, from Russia's point of view, the other side overthrew the constitution and relied on, you know, street power, including armed street power, then yes, the option has been taken up. I'm extremely sorry to say, extremely sorry to say, because I've, you know, well, I talked about the Serbian option because it was better known to Western audiences, but of course, uh, one saw the absolutely catastrophic role of ethnic militias in the Caucasus as well in the 1990s. You know, the Georgian militias, which um, seized power between, well, essentially 1990 and 1992. Um, the, the role of militias in, in Abkhazia, in a South Ossetia, in, on both sides of the, of the Karabakh um, conflict, which tore the region apart. Um, and I think we are now seeing this in, in um, in, in Ukraine, and of course, what, what one also has saw so much in, in the Caucasus, I can't really speak for the former Yugoslavia because I didn't cover that conflict, but what, what one saw in, in, um, in the Caucasus, in, in all three areas, in countries, 
uh, was how, of course, once these militias have come into being, they, they do, or their leaders develop, agendas and ambitions of their own. You know, one saw that in Georgia with uh, Kitovani and Yoseliani, one saw it in, in Armenia with the way in which the, essentially the, uh, the volunteer army eventually seize power and establish what is to this day a kind of military dictatorship and so forth. And I think we're seeing it in, in eastern Ukraine now because one only has to think oneself into the, um, you know, into the shoes of, you know, these new militia leaders, you know, these bosses, Denis, whatever his name is, and so forth. Um, to, you, you know, you, 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 can, you can imagine how they're thinking. That, that you know, that, that's why I said, you know, if, if one has orderly, legitimate, internationally supervised elections there, my belief is that these people will be shoved out again, you know, will be, will be uh, excluded, that the population will not vote for them. Well, of course, th that is precisely why these kind of groups need to keep the crisis going. You know, do not want to be led into a Ukrainian constitutional process, because if they can keep the crisis going, then they have a real chance of emerging as the permanent princes, if you like. Um, uh, with, with, to a great extent, Russia dependent on them as much as they are dependent on Russia. With, at the same time, of course, all the wonderful opportunities which come, the economic opportunities, from being an unrecognized state, from not being, you know, part of Ukraine, but also not being legally part of Russia. All the wonderful opportunities for smuggling and money laundering you know, that Transnistria has demonstrated so greatly. So that is why, you know, I am so passionately in favor of, you know, the creation of a, of a Ukrainian, con an agreed Ukrainian constitutional process, which will give us a chance of getting rid of these creatures again. And, and also, of course, will um, deprive Russia of the, the, the opportunity and the motives uh, to try to, um, to, to get, you know, movements like this going elsewhere because you know we we have seen of course in odessa particularly um that there could you, you know there could be real opportunities uh, there too um what do you think about the ukrainian shale gas field that was found in the region of uh, donetsk and uh, kharkov um slavyansk is in the center of this uh, ukrainian uh, shale gas field. Mm, can it be one of the reasons of the Ukrainian crisis? I, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 this is about ethnicity and culture and loyalties. Um, you know, if the, if the shale gas field had been discovered in Chernigov, you know, it would have made no difference. I mean, it would have made no, no difference um, because you can't actually get a movement like this going in Chernigov. Uh, I, I, I don't think that th this is what Russia's calculations are about. There's, there's always the temptation to talk about energy. Um, you know, in the case of Chechnya, uh, some people said that, oh, this was all about oil. They hadn't noticed that uh, the oil had basically run out in Chechnya a generation before. You know. um, no, I, I don't think so. Um. <coughs> As you mentioned in your speech, uh, Poland has been uh, one of the uh, main players of this crisis. Uh, I would like to go uh, better in details about the role uh, Poland uh, played, because uh, uh, I think that uh, most of the reason of this crisis are uh, rooted uh, uh, back in the last century. And uh, I cannot understand uh, how the uh, uh, anti-Russian uh, attitude uh, of uh, Poland uh, could be mixed uh, with the, uh, what is emerging uh, as uh, the, the real uh, nationalism uh, who is uh, leading uh, uh, the square. Uh, because you know that uh, most of the young people in uh, uh, Maidan Square uh, were uh, wearing uh, uh, pins uh, with uh, Stefan Bandera and uh, this is a name uh, that is very popular uh, in, uh, in uh, Kiev and that is very unknown uh, in, a Western, uh, uh, in the Western observers. So what do you think about this? Uh, 
Well, first of all, I should say, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, it wasn't that most of the people in, in the Maidan were wearing these, these Bandera badges. I think the Maidan was clearly a mixture of two things. I mean, one, people who genuinely did want to move towards the West, you know, who identify reform with the European Union. Um, and uh, as, as I've written in, in several pieces, um, were opposed to, to membership of the Eurasian Union, not so much because they were anti-Russian as because they saw the Eurasian Union as fixing forever in Ukraine the, the deeply corrupt, oligarchical and backward system you know, which had dominated Ukraine since independence and which, after all, has been responsible for, amongst other things, such a steep economic decline of Ukraine. But you're quite right. I mean, at, at the same time, I mean, people wearing those badges did, did also play a very prominent role, especially, of course, among the, the, the more violent <laughs> demonstrators. Um, I mean, my, my, my own sense is, is that, look, one has to understand Polish fears, you know, and, and given, given Polish history. Um, the, the, the problem, I think, is that, well, I had a, a sense very early on of how things were, uh, were going in this regard. When I, I was part of a, of a, of a round table, um, pretty soon after the, the, the Soviet Union collapsed, I think it was in 93, and the Polish ambassador was warning about the, the continued Russian military threat to, to Poland. And he said, you know, and you, we, we have to recognize, and he was speaking to the German um, uh, ambassador who was there as well, you have to recognize that Russia has 250,000 combat-ready troops in Kaliningrad, and they could cross Poland in a day and invade Germany. Now, I'd actually been in, I was based in the Baltic at that time, I'd been in Kaliningrad, uh, and, and, and I, I, I said, but, you know, I'm sorry, but, well, I, I, w I waited to see if anyone else would say something. And then I said, but look, I'm terribly sorry, but actually, you know, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a fraction of that, and they're falling to pieces, you know, and it's mostly the Navy, and they couldn't invade <laughs> anywhere, you know. It, um, but the point was that nobody else ran the table, and I asked them afterwards, you know, look, your intelligence services must tell you this is nonsense. Why didn't you say it's nonsense? Um, and the, the response was, oh, but, you know, you have to understand the Polish fears and so on. I said, yeah, yeah, but look, there were Russians listening to this, and you didn't say anything. What impression is this going to give to the Russians if you seem to endorse this nonsense? Oh, no, we have to understand Polish fears, you see? <laughs> but, and uh, the, the, the sort of there's a real confusion here between understanding. You know, one, one has to understand many fears in this world. I mean, look, I understand Pakistani fears of India. That does not mean that I have to endorse the resulting Pakistani, you know, policies and attitudes. Um, and and I'm, I'm afraid that you see the the. I mean, a key problem here in in the European Union is that we do. The very nature of the European Union means that we contract areas out. Now, in Pakistan, for example, Britain is generally regarded as the lead European country. It's the country to which all the other European countries come, basically for advice, you know, um, for, for information, and to an extent, uh, only informally, of course, shape their own policies accordingly. France has long played this, this role in um, North Africa. In the process, it must be said, betraying every single alleged European democratic and humanitarian principle, every one over the years. You know, look at Algeria and so forth and so on. But it's all right. It's fr this is, this is, was part of the French Empire. This is France's. Leave it to France. Uh, well, I'm afraid that to some extent, um, you know, aspects of, of policy towards Russia have been left to, to, to Poland and, um, and Sweden. One should mention the role of Karl Bildt as well in this regard. And n not that this, you know, this was ever consciously done, but one, one has the I impression that the Germans in particular woke up from a deep sleep at some stage. Um, 
you know, under the magic mountain um, or on the magic mountain. They, they had, uh, you know, German policy was just for, for, for months on end appears to have been fast asleep as, as far as um, Ukraine was concerned. And then now they're sort of, <laughs> because of course there are vital German interests involved here um, and there are also historical memories which, uh, in which Ukraine played rather a large role in the loss of um, several million German lives. Uh, but very late, you see, only now is Germany playing, you know, a really active and leading role. Uh, where, whereas, you, you know, as I say, if, if you um, uh, think of what uh, Romano Prodi was saying, you know, G Germany could have been playing a leading role uh, last summer in trying perhaps to negotiate some sort of uh, agreement with the Russians. I, I'm not saying that that would necessarily have worked. Uh, but even to have attempted it, you, you know, would at least have shown Russia that there was some attempt to take their interests into account and that they were not simply being, you know, that this wasn't part of, a, of an attempt to drive them out of Ukraine. I, I should say, by the way, that, you know, um, one of the things that was dismissed without any serious Western discussion at all uh, was Medvedev's proposal a number of years back um, for some kind of European institutionalized consultative uh, body, a sort of European Security Council, um, which would prevent something like the Georgia War happening again by sort of alerting people to problems and creating an institutional forum where things could be negotiated. Well, nobody, nobody even discussed that, because of course the Americans hated the idea um, and it was coming from Russia, so it was, even though it was coming from Medvedev, who we, you know, on the other hand, wanted to present as the more, you know, moderate face of, of Russian policy. Well, I think what's, uh, you know, I, I think that the Ukrainian crisis has demonstrated that was actually a very good idea, you know, that, um, that it would have given us the, at least the opportunity to sit down together and head off, you know, this, this, this crisis. My name is Antonio Fattore. I want to put you two questions. The first one is this. Don't you think that it's very dangerous uh, the, this sort of apathy, indiffer indifference in the public opinions of the West? Uh, the idea that there can be no war. But we unfortunately know that the war happens for reasonable reasons and irrational reasons. Uh, it's, it's good to remember that <laughs> it is w one century ago was uh, the, f the, the beginning of the First World War. Yeah. The second question is this one. It's evident can a conflict in uh, uh, Ukraine could be extremely, give enormous damage to Europe, less to the United States. My, the, the question is why Europe cannot distinguish from uh, uh, the policy of the United States? Uh, the, per, the, the question is who, who commands in uh, Europe, the er European institutions or the NATO? Yeah. Well, I, I entirely agree. I mean, the, the, the indifference, the apathy of um, European populations, and, and, and also it must be said, you know, actually the American population, uh, because the, 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 the tremendously noisy rhetoric coming out of Washington is, is not characteristic of, of the vast mass of the American population at all. And indeed, you know, as we've seen in poll after poll recently, including on Syria, the last thing that most Americans want to do is get involved in, you know, more uh, overseas adventures. But the problem is that that doesn't lead um, to, you know, an active involvement behind a sensible diplomatic strategy, it just, it seems, leads to indifference, and that, of course, in turn, enables the extremists, you know, the, 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 the activists, if the, you know, if the mass of the population is, 
possibly at heart sensible, but also profoundly apathetic, then by definition, the people who are really passionate, you know, will, will make most of the, the public discussion. Um, the second thing is on, on the threat of war. Yes, I entirely agree. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, y you see, I, I do worry about Europe in disarming itself. Um, but then again, you know, we, we could have uh, 10 times the number of troops that we have, and all of them could be, you know, co combat ready volunteers. And we still wouldn't fight in Ukraine. So <laughs> the notion is, you know, that we need a, you know, a stronger European defense somehow to defend against Russia. Uh, it, it just doesn't add up. Now, this has also been obscured, I should say. Um, uh, I didn't mention this, by the, the, this absolute cloud of nonsense uh, about how the um, Russian actions in Ukraine imply you know, a threat to Poland, to the Baltic, to Romania, to Kazakhstan. They don't. Um, uh, I mean, to some extent, um, to countries with, uh, of course, Russian minorities. But then, you know, as long as these countries pursue you know, democratic constitutional paths, and as long as their populations do not, in fact, revolt, there won't be any point d'appui for Russia to act on that. But there's no, there's no threat to, to, to Poland whatsoever. My, my fear precisely is that by half-promising security guarantees or, you know, demanding it on the part of Britain and America and, and Poland and other countries as well for places that there were no there was no way that we would ever defend, that we were actually weakening our guarantees elsewhere. Now, that might not matter much as far as Europe is concerned, because I don't think that you know, Russia is threatening other countries. Uh, but I, I think the Americans have been profoundly foolish in this regard, because I think that it, it does weaken the credibility of their deterrence, you know, of their alliances elsewhere. Um, and on that score, um, the, the, the threat of war, um, yes, uh, I, I, I entirely agree with you. I, I mean, I, having been a you know, war correspondent in, in several conflicts, I've sort of, and, and being somewhat pessimistic by character, uh, I've wondered you know, whether you know, I exaggerate some of the threats. But I think you know, what's happening in Ukraine does demonstrate that I mean, not, not that there is a, a really serious threat of Russian invasion, because I think Russia, at least not now, because I think Russia probably has enough of what it needs and wants, and certainly a, a, an invasion would be extremely bad for, for Russian interests and very risky. But I will say this. Um, if the United States extends to China the kind of attitudes and the kind of policies uh, that it has to Russia over the past generation, then, ladies and gentlemen, we will find ourselves in another major international war, uh, which will bring the world economy down in ruins, and with it probably uh, many democracies around the world, including our own. Uh, I hope that the fact that um, an American policy which did this would deserve the results it got, will be a comfort to our descendants. Um, I would like to say, uh, what do you think about uh, the new European election under the light of uh, the Ukrainian crisis? It could be, uh, I think, d do you see a, a little light in it or not? Well, I mean, the, the, the critical thing in the European elections, of course, are, is just how well the extreme right will do in, in every country. I mean, the anti-European forces. Um, in, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that our UK Independence Party is extreme right in that way, but it's certainly bitterly anti-European, of course, and anti-immigrant, and then, you know, you have so many others, including in, in Italy. Um, I mean, that, that is, I, 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 I suppose the, the, the point here is, is, is twofold. I mean, one, that 
I, I've always been very skeptical outside the European Union and outside countries which have a realistic chance of joining the European Union within a, a set, predictable, and limited space of time. Now, for them, it makes sense, as it has made perfect sense uh, for the Baltic states, Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, etc., etc., and the Balkans as well, to talk about a path to democracy and the free market, because there is a path. Um, it's called the U U European Union accession process, and there is a goal, which is the acquis communautaire unit. But <coughs> elsewhere, I've always been very skeptical of all this, this language of an, an inevitable path towards d democracy and so forth, because <coughs> so many of the necessary elements have been missing. And what I have always believed is that outside our immediate neighborhood, by far the greatest asset we have uh, in spreading democracy uh, is not our, our, our external policies, but our example, the force of example of European democracy and the force of example of the European Union as a body which has bound together its region behind democracy, prosperity, and peace. But surely one thing must be absolutely obvious that if, God forbid, the National Front prevails in France, you know, and, and forms a government or, or forms the main opposition, if, if Gert Wilders takes over the government in, uh, in um, Holland, then what on earth is the point of us preaching democracy to Ukraine or anywhere else? Who, I mean, there are on, on the contrary, what we will be providing an example of is precisely an example of successful radical nationalism, successful radical national, uh, authoritarian nationalism. What's the point of Britain advocating the expansion of the European Union if the UK Independence Party takes Britain out of the European Union? So, you know, I've always believed that we, you know, our, our first duty you know, not just for our own sakes, but from the point of view of our, you know, our example uh, in the world, must be, you know, to, to, to maintain, to strengthen, to cultivate the strength of our own democratic and economic systems. Um, because without that, ev everything else becomes, uh, well, actually, we, we risk sending a negative example to the rest of the world. Um, but uh, the, the only other thing perhaps I might add is that... Um, uh, I, I can't really speak for the, for the others, but um, certainly with the UK Independence Party one in, in Britain, uh, one does see uh, one thing contributing to that is a very strong mood against further outside commitments. You know, so they, they, oppo they oppose the war in, you know, involvement in the war in Syria. You know, they oppose involvement in a crisis in Ukraine because the, the kind of constituency that they're playing to says, no, we've got too many problems at home. Let's concentrate on, on these. Um, which you could call a parochial view. Or, of course, you could call it a very sensible view, given that actually we do have a lot of problems at home. A drink, perhaps? <laughs> 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 Good evening. Um, I was wondering, do you think there is still a chance of postponing these elections? And the second thing is that um, it's about how do you think we should start in, nego in negotiating a federal reform? I mean, in this moment, it's true that in general it's better to have <coughs> a reform before elections, but in this case we have extremists of Svoboda in Parliament, <coughs> and on the other side, we have representatives in the western side, in the eastern side, that are not even considered by the uh, Dimitrian government in Kiev. And also, we have some governors now put by the Kiev government, <coughs> which are these oligarchs that are in the middle between Russia and what concerns interests, maybe, and in between these and the, their will to show that they are with Europe. So 
I yeah. do mix this, and if they need uh, maybe an international ad, I mean, what's the plan? Well, I think th th there is just a chance still, just a chance of, of the presidential elections being being postponed, uh, given, you know, above all, the, the, the risk that, other, that um, they could turn into a farce, which will, you know, from the Western point of view, actually discredit our side, if you like, and will lead to a, a result which just does not have credibility. Also, of course, the risk that um, the elections could be uh, a, 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 a factor in, in spreading violence to other areas. You know, one could well imagine how this could lead to violent clashes in places which so far the violence has been contained. But as I say, I mean, we're, we're running out of, of time, you know, very, very fast. Uh, I mean, uh, as to the, the procedure, it does seem to me that um, uh, one, one needs first to get a, a, a private agreement with Russia on the parameters of this. Um, because if, I mean, if, if it, 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 don't get me wrong, I mean, if, if, if Moscow's intention is to have a, a federation so loose that Ukraine doesn't work at all as a country, well, then that has no future in it. So first, I mean, one has to work out just, just how much Russia does want in that regard. But if, you know, Russia is, is prepared to live with a, a kind of standard federation model with built-in guarantee, you know, as I talked about, two-thirds majorities in, a, in an upper house and so forth, then, you know, that uh, uh, the rough outlines of this as agreed, it has to be said, essentially between Germany and Russia should then become the plan that is presented to um, the Ukrainian government. Um, I wish I could say this in, in I I Italian, but I can only say it in Spanish. Um, Poderoso caballero es el señor dinero. Uh, in other words, if, if we're giving the Ukrainians $15 billion, I think we actually probably do have the right to tell them something about, you know, <laughs> their internal affairs. Um, just as, you know, if Russia is, as we all know, giving weapons to people in the Donbass, it has both a right and a responsibility, you know, to bring them by the ear to the negotiating table. Um, and, I mean, this will be a difficult process. I mean, many, many details would have to be hammered out. Uh, but um, I... Uh, well... I don't know. So I was about to say something very wicked, um, which perhaps demonstrates the fact that I've spent much too much time in, in um, Pakistan, uh, and, but also does uh, reflect the fact that I've just come back from India, where um, it looks as if they are about to elect a very unpleasant person as their prime minister in the form of Mr. Modi. So what I was about to say was that um, the elections I like best are the ones where I know the result in advance. Um, I didn't say that, you understand. I will never say something like that. <laughs> but it is a bit of a problem about elections that one can't be sure of you know, what's going to happen. And my, my problem is, you know, we, we, we just don't know what a presidency coming out of elections like this would do in Ukraine. Um, and we, you know, we, we, you know we, we risk spreading violence and disorder. We don't know what the result would be. I think it makes much more sense to have the constitutional framework, you know, ag agreed in advance. And then, of course, um, if my analysis of, of these, you, you know, militias in eastern Ukraine and their motivations is correct, well, then they have every motive, including, of course, economic, to disrupt the elections. So, of course, you have all these factors potentially feeding into a very, very, very bad election. Um, process. I, I, I should say, by the way, that uh, I, I wasn't really talking about Pakistan when I said um, elections. Um, the, uh, last, last autumn, in an unguarded moment, um, a NATO officer in Afghanistan did say just this to me about the Afghan elections. He didn't quite realize what he was saying, but he, he said, you know, the problem about these elections, he said, is we don't know the result. <laughs> 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 so...